This episode is brought to you by my friend Rebecca Walser, a financial expert who can help you protect your wealth. Book your free call with her team by going to friendofdinesh.com. That's friendofdinesh.com. Uh, coming up, I'll discuss the comprehensive agenda of the House GOP over the next two years. Debbie's going to join me. We're going to talk about Kevin McCarthy, how John Kerry became thick pals with Maduro, the Marxist axis of evil in the Americas, and why Democrats are the evil party. I'm also going to continue my discussion of Christianity and science. This is the Dinesh D'Souza Show. America needs this voice. The times are crazy in a time of confusion, division, and lies. We need a brave voice of reason, understanding, and truth. This is the Dinesh D'Souza Podcast. When the uh, skirmish erupted between um, Kevin McCarthy and his supporters and the 20 or so House dissidents, uh, almost all of them drawn from the House Freedom Caucus, when uh, all of that was occurring, it was acrimonious, it was uh, somewhat bitter, and it was being, of course, amplified in the media. And there were some people, even some Republicans, who were like, this is, this is no way to do business. Uh, this, all, this discussion should occur behind closed doors. Why are we holding up the important business of Congress? And, of course, people like Dan Crenshaw, who wanted a McCarthy to be, oh, you can almost say, accepted by, by group acclaim. We don't even need to have a vote. Let's just all agree he's our great leader. Um, Crenshaw was, um, again, suggesting that there's important business for the House to do, and that business would be held up uh, by this kind of an unconscionable delay. But we now know that the delay was short. What, four days? Big deal. Uh, as if to say that, you know, this is something that couldn't wait because things had to be done. No. Uh, four days later, we look at the result and we realize the result is much, much better. The reason it's um, that this uh, ploy worked, and it was a risky ploy because, of course, things would have gone very bad had McCarthy become so desperate that he started courting the votes of Democrats. This is something in the back of my mind I was worried about. I didn't think it was likely, but nevertheless, it was possible. But um, fortunately, it didn't happen. Uh, and the two sides have kind of come together. McCarthy has made a whole bunch of concessions. And the key point is his concessions aren't minor. They aren't just procedural. They changed the whole way of doing business in the House. And I talked about that yesterday. They've um, resulted in important uh, things like a new church committee to investigate sort of deep state abuse. That's going to be critically important. That's something that we simply had to do. Uh, and I think it would be a, a real black mark against the GOP if it had left that out. But I want to give you some sense of the comprehensiveness of the McCarthy agenda. This is not McCarthy's own agenda. This is the agenda that he agreed to with, you know, kind of a gun to his head. Uh, in other words, what the House uh, Freedom Caucus guys realize is, in a way, we, are, we have more power than McCarthy. True, he has 200 votes and we have 20. And this is the point that kind of Hannity never got. Hannity's like, well, to Lauren Boebert, well, why don't you concede? You're asking McCarthy to step down, but he has 200, you have 20. But the point is, McCarthy needed to get almost all the Republicans to become speaker. And so they realized, the uh, Boebert and others, that McCarthy needed them more than they needed him. And so they cut a deal that's a very favorable deal. And let's look at some of the things that McCarthy has agreed to. In addition to uh, the committee to investigate the deep state, in addition to the new way of doing business in the House, and by the way, in addition to the repeal of the IRS agents. Now, by itself, that doesn't defund the agents, but it does put uh, some legislative power behind that idea, an idea that I think will live to fight another day. Uh, McCarthy agreed that a single congressperson acting on a Jeffersonian motion can vote to remove the speaker. That's new. I mentioned the church-style committee. Term limits are going to be put up for a vote. Again, congressmen generally don't like term limits. You can kind of see here the view of the Republican establishment. We'd like to be congressmen as long as we can. If we stop being congressmen, we want to be running for the Senate. But we don't really want to go back to normal life where we have to get up at 8 in the morning, shave, do a normal day's work. So they don't like term limits, but term limits is on the agenda. Single subject bills, no omnibus bills that just have 400 things in them where you don't even have time to read it and all kinds of giveaways and earmarks are thrown in there. 
The Texas border plan is going to be put before Congress. And this is, by the way, an effort to create a full physical border infrastructure, change border enforcement policies, enforce our laws in the interior, which is to say to go after lawbreakers who are roaming free among us and finally target cartels and criminal organizations. Biden's border policy, a complete disaster. It looks like the House is at the very least going to be making some genuine effort. Uh, to challenge all this. COVID mandates will be ended as well as all funding for them, including so-called emergency funding. A lot of times, uh, by and large, the Biden administration is kind of like, ask and you shall receive. It's an emergency. We need to have this allocation of additional money. And the House GOP answer now, no. Uh, budget bills don't uh, automatically defer to a kind of extension of the debt ceiling. In other words, spend as much as you want. If we don't have the money, we don't have the guts to raise taxes to get it. We'll just raise the debt ceiling. No, there are a whole bunch of Republican congressmen now that want to put a rein on spending. Look, we the United States is a very rich country. We can spend a lot of money, but there is a limit. Uh, because uh, the fastest way to become a poor country is to keep outspending your means, to keep raising the, the deficit and the debt, which has now reached gargantuan astronomical levels. So uh, introducing an element of fiscal prudence. Now, will all of this pan out? Will all of this um, uh, result in good things? I don't know. We have to be cautious and we also have to be vigilant in keeping our House members on their toes, so to speak. Because, uh, And I think the House Freedom Caucus is going to try to make sure that these uh, concessions, these agreements, these deals uh, made by McCarthy are in fact kept uh, and are enforced because if they're not, let's remember, it only takes one member of the House to put McCarthy's own speakership up for a vote. Let's all sleep really well in 2023. And the way to do that, good pillows and good sheets. Now, Mike Lindell is running a sale on his Giza Dream bed sheets as low as $29.99. Mike promises the first night you sleep in these sheets, you're never going to want to sleep on anything else. The Giza Dream bed sheets are made with the world's best cotton called Giza. Long staple cotton, which makes it ultra soft and breathable. It's sateen weave, gives the sheets a luxurious Finish available in multiple colors, styles, and sizes. Machine washable and durable. 10-year warranty, 60-day money-back guarantee. So let's go. Call 800-876-0227. That number, 800-876-0227. Or go to MyPillow.com to get these discounts. You need to use promo code D-I-N-E-S-H Dinesh. Debbie and I here for our Friday Roundup, but before we get started, um, somebody had a big birthday this week. Yep, and a really big one. <laughs> uh oh, really big one. Yep. I don't. I don't mind though telling people how old I am. Uh, I know some. In fact, when you've done it in the past, people get get mad at you. They're like, "You shouldn't say Debbie's age. You shouldn't tell people Debbie's age." But I don't mind people knowing I'm 57. It's okay. Well, you got. People love the fact I posted a photo of you and on social media and you got a lot of comments, very nice comments. And um, and uh, so we're grateful for those. Yeah, it's kind of funny. I was on when I was doing my locals live Q&A on, on Tuesday. People were like, well, how did how did you guys celebrate the birthday? And I'm like, Debbie's really low key. I mean, to, I think for you, an, a, kind of an easygoing day where we just get some good food and bring it home. <laughs> right? Well, that, that's kind of my thing every day. <laughs> <laughs> Not just birthday. It's, uh, you know, you know, I like it. I like yeah. just being low key. I like staying at home. I'm a homebody. I don't like to go to parties. I don't like to, you know, celebrate. Well, we got we have we have some new neighbors, and so this past weekend we pre-celebrated Debbie's birthday by going out with them just to get to know them better. They're after all going to be the guys next door. Really nice couple. It was really really fun. All right, let's talk about what's going on in the world, and um, I want to start with this um, ominous meeting and handshake between Nicolas Maduro, the dictator of Venezuela and one John Kerry. You were, well, hopping mad about it, and rightly so. Yeah, and so, and the reason I even knew about it is my cousin from Venezuela uh, sent me a video. He goes, can you believe this madness? You know, he was super mad about this. 
And of course, you know, on social media, there are a lot of people that are saying, wait a minute, wasn't Nicolas Maduro, what wasn't he, ha didn't he have a $15 million bounty um, because he's a narco terrorist? And, and so the State Department had a bounty on him. Um, and here we are, you know, seeing John Kerry at the e Egyptian summit, the climate change summit in, in Egypt, um, shaking hands with him. What, what's up with that? And so everybody assumes that it's because Joe Biden and, and Kerry, um, love pow, you know, uh, what is it called? Palling around. Palling around with terrorists. But, you know, it goes much deeper than that. And you had, um, uh, someone the other day, Frank, uh, Gaffney. Frank Gaffney the other day, yeah. talking about the access of evil in the in the, on our Western Hemisphere and about how these are Marxists and they're taking they're taking the Western Hemisphere in a Marxist direction, and so so my concern is not so much the narco terrorism although it's horrible, but it's it's the fact that the reason John Kerry and Joe Biden like Maduro is not so much anything other than the fact that they're on the same ideological spectrum. Yeah, this is a really important point right? because I think uh, there might be people naively who look at this and go, okay, we know what's going on. Number one, uh, John Kerry is very concerned about climate change and Maduro is making the same noises. So there's a climate change sort of solidarity between them. Or alternatively, Joe Biden needs to try to bring down gas prices to reduce his unpopularity. He needs to get some oil out of Venezuela. So this is an opportunistic move. But you're saying, no, there's a deep ideological alliance here. Not mm -hmm. that they're ideologically the same, but um, they're similar they're and very, they're working in concert. They're very similar. I mean, and, the, the, and who's the they? Let's go through okay. the Okay, because so, it isn't just those two guys. No, so it's Lula, okay, Lula in, in Brazil. Brazil, and of course Maduro, and he's just following Hugo Chavez's footsteps, right, Mr. 21st Century Socialism. Um, and then, of course, it's uh, the United States, the le you know the Democrats, which a lot of Venezuelans don't still don't understand the similarities. Of, of, of the party, of the Democrat Party and the Venezuelan Socialist Party. So uh, so the alliance is definitely there. And uh, probably, let's see, who well, else? continue. You have Chile. Chile, right. You have, uh, well, you have Mexico. Uh, Mexico uh, Lopez Obrador is, and uh, Peru. is a socialist. Peru. Peru, yes. In some ways, I think you could even include Justin Trudeau. Because, oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, oh, for sure. For sure, right? Yes, uh, yes. Did you know that recently uh, Biden, Trudeau, and Obrador got together for one of those joint diversity inclusion statements, yes, yes. basically committing all three governments to promoting uh, ethnic and cultural and well, gender, and I mean, perhaps look transgender. At, look at who started this whole ethnic thing. Uh, Hugo Chavez did. And, uh, you know, just demonizing the white people in Venezuela. And, and this is a trend. So people think that that, uh, you know, in Venezuela, oh, no, 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 that's a different kind of socialism. Well, okay, maybe it's a different kind of socialism in that it involves a lot of narco, you know, terrorist, terroristic threads in there, where we, whereas we don't. But the ideology is exactly the same. They still divide people based on socioeconomic status. They still divide people based on race and ethnicity. So uh, the division of people, making people hate each other is is something that is definitely going on. And I think even on the narco-terrorist side, it's not as if the Biden administration is promoting narco-terrorism, but they are in bed with the cartels on the border they're issue. In, so they are right. they are complicit with narco-terrorism because they recognize it's a predict predictable consequence of policies they actively support. Right. And so in, in, in a way, uh, it is kind of a, the, the access of evil, right, is going to come back to bite us because uh, this is this is just horrible. And, you know, it really reminds me also of when when Obama and Hugo Chavez were seen, you know, chumming around, shaking hands, Hillary Clinton. I mean, all of these people, You, it, it's not it's not by sheer coincidence that Hugo Chavez and Maduro like the Democrats and not the Republicans. 
You've heard the term fresh start. The phrase literally means an opportunity to begin something again. And you know you need a fresh start in your eating habits, right? How many times last year did you say to yourself, I need to start eating better? Well, eating fruits and veggies in the right quantity every day? Almost impossible. I have a more convenient way for you to make that fresh start with balance of nature. Now, sourced from 31 whole fruits and vegetables, you'll get maximum nutrition with their star product, which is this, the fruits and veggies in a capsule. Debbie and I take them every day, and I want you to do so also. And right now, take advantage of their New Year's offer, which is $25 off, plus free fiber and spice with your first preferred order of the fruits and veggies when you use discount code America. This offer can end at any time, so don't wait. Call 800-246-8751. That number again, 800-246-8751, or go to balanceofnature.com. Use discount code America. I've been talking about the, um, well, the Trump classified information and the Biden classified information and... uh, It is interesting that new revelations keep popping out one after the other and undercutting the left's effort to distinguish. They want to say Trump's classified info bad, Biden's classified info no big deal. Yeah. And then step by step, they're being undercut. Uh, What what do you make of this as you watch? Are you surprised? I mean, Mm. are you surprised? I'm not surprised. Um, and the, the thing about it is, is Biden did a lot of really underhanded things when he was vice president. As we now know, uh, he made deals with China um, and so the Ukraine. And so, you know, I, it doesn't surprise me. Nothing surprises me. Well, this is an important tidbit, which is to say that China is a big funder of the Penn Biden Center. And the, where, where are these classified documents found at the Penn Biden Center? So one question that hasn't really been raised is what was China's access to those, to that information? First of all, is, what do we mean by classified information? Sometimes they classify stuff that's no big deal. But there are also national secrets and there is also stuff that we would not want to be in the hands of China. And yet no one's claiming that Trump's information got into Chinese hands. But hey, here we go with Biden. It's a possibility. (laughs) Right? Yeah. Well, I mean, we know that Biden is his biatch, (laughs) you know, Xi Jinping's and Maduro's. I mean, these they have him where they want him. And so so unfortunately, um, for for us, because our media is so, so corrupt and so dishonest that they didn't bring any of this up before the midterms. And and I think that they knew before the midterms. I yeah. really do. Well, you know, I saw something interesting that Joy Behar said on The View, and she was basically saying, we know that Trump is a liar and a thief. And so we are going to approach what she was saying is we're going to take an identical situation and approach it completely differently. Mm. Uh, Because one guy we know is a liar, and I guess what she meant by contrast is the other guy we know is honest. And see, this is a way of um, getting away from the notion that you're applying the same rules to everybody. In in effect, what you're saying is there are two teams, the, the evil team, them, meaning us, and the good team, which is the left. So the left can do anything. If the left engages in tyranny, well, it's good tyranny. If they Mm -hmm. engage in racial discrimination, it's good racial discrimination. If they use even racial epithets, well, they're using it in a good cause. They're trying to promote diversity and equity. So suddenly you have a complete breakdown of all procedural norms. But but they can't admit that. They can't say, listen, we think it's okay for Obama and Clinton and Biden to have classified information, but not Trump. So they've got to find some Jesuitical minor difference like Biden returned the documents promptly, which turns out to be not true. Yeah, yeah. They, do you do you think what do you think is going to happen? Do you think that they're going to let it be with Trump and just go, uh, "Oops, we better not pursue Trump because now we, if we pursue Trump, we have to pursue Biden." So, yes. do you think that that's what's going to happen? I, I think I think it is going to rebound on the Trump case mm-hmm. because think about it. Let's imagine they indict Trump. They take mm-hmm. him to court. Trump goes first of all. <laughs> Every previous president, including the current one, has classified information in their possession. Including right? the So guy. let's call them as witnesses for them to explain why they, it's okay for them, but not okay for me. 
I mean, it's a, it would be a disaster in court. So I think they will quietly start dropping this. Not that they will stop going after Trump, as yeah, you know. They'll find something they're, else. They're going to look for something yeah. else to go after. But they've they've tried almost everything. I mean, they've tried. <laughs> well, you know, he raped me in the Bergdorf Goodman bathroom. Oh, that God. didn't work. Uh, then they tried the, well, you know, he paid off Stormy Daniels. Oh, and they, yeah, then they tried the, you know, the phone call to the Ukraine. Oh. I mean, this this is like an inexhaustible, January endless, 6. never I mean, ending. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he incited January 6th. Yeah. By the way, not the guy who said, I orchestrated the whole thing. That's Ray Epps. But Trump somehow orchestrated it even without orchestrating it. Yeah, no, and, and it's true. But but I, I do think, though, the, that it's very, very interesting how this came to light and how the DOJ is not going to know what to do with Trump. It's going to, it's going to, let's see how it plays out. But we do know that we're not on a level playing field here. We know that. So, of course, anything Trump does, bad. Anything Biden does, good. Well, here's proof, so, of, here's proof of that already. Yeah. And that is that Merrick Garland has appointed a special counsel to look at Trump. Well, he's decided not to have a special counsel for Biden. He's just referred it to someone in the DOJ and said, you look into it. Now, that guy happens to be a Trump appointee. So Merrick Garland is trying to do his best to give a, a sort of a patina uh, of even handedness. But no, if you have a special counsel in the one case, why not a Jonathan Turley and others? Let's have a special counsel in the Biden case. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we know that that's not it's probably not going to happen. It's we probably not going to happen. Yeah. I, I agree. Um, any thoughts about um, the aftermath of the Kevin McCarthy showdown with the with the yeah. House um, well, conservatives? You know, just one little thing is, you know, I have a friend, a high school friend who on on Facebook comes out and he's like, I'm done with the Republicans. I, I'm going to join a third party. And I was like, you know, first of all, it what's what's happening is actually good for the party and it's good for America. Right. Second of all. If you're a conservative and you're advocating for a third party, you are shooting yourself in the foot because when you divide the pie, if you divide half the pie that way, the only winners that are going to come out of it are going to be the left. It's going to be the Democrats. So if you want the Democrats to keep winning elections, join a third party. Debbie and I started taking Relief Factor a couple of years ago. The difference we've seen in our joints has been nothing short of amazing. Aches and pains are basically gone thanks to this 100% drug-free solution called Relief Factor. Relief Factor supports your body's fight against inflammation. That's the source of aches and pains. The vast majority of people who try Relief Factor order more because it works for them. Debbie's a true believer. She's finally able to do all her exercises, planks, push-ups, and so on. But for many years, she wasn't able to. It's been a real game changer for her, her aunt, other members of our family, and for many other people. You too can benefit. Try it for yourself. Order the three-week quick start for the discounted price of only $19.95. Go to relieffactor.com or call 833-690-7246 to find out more about this offer. That number again, 833-690-7246 or go to relieffactor.com. You'll feel the difference. Debbie and I frequently hear people talk about how their kids get brainwashed or indoctrinated in school or in college, sometimes even as they enter the workplace. And more than once, uh, people speculate and go, you know, I would just like to have, I'd like to deprogram or de-brainwash my kids. And uh, sure enough, here we find a fascinating article about parents who are taking that idea seriously, the idea of in a sense, removing this kind of ideological indoctrination from their kids that has been implanted by bureaucrats and in some cases also by teachers. Yeah, so, so yeah, this is really interesting. So this this woman um, that leads the article here, uh, her name is Beth Pensky. She's a single mother from New Jersey and she lives in Florida now. And she says that her children do not speak to her because they are woke and she is not. <laughs> I hope oh, that she's using goodness. the power of the purse to yes, make them feel yes, it. Yes, yes. So anyway, so of course, you know, she she just was horrified by, by this. Um, but uh, she did find that she was not alone. Um, there, there are a number of other mothers 
that uh, that claim that their kids are totally indoctrinated uh, with hard left ideologies uh, and they need to be deprogrammed. I mean, this so, is interesting because she talks about in the article a, a woman named Annabella Rockwell who graduated from Mount Holyoke who actually came to the recognition that she herself had been indoctrinated by these hard left ideologies and she wanted to be deprogrammed. And so this is what this is what uh, Mrs. Penske says. She goes, I saw Annabella's story and my life turned upside down. I realized I wasn't alone. Um, I, I never even considered trying to find a deprogrammer. I didn't know they existed. Yeah. Um, but apparently they do. Apparently yeah. there are people who do this kind of deprogramming. Yeah. And, and in, what's interesting about it, the woman searching for the deprogrammer is a Democrat. Yeah, she's a Democrat and a liberal. But she said, but it doesn't matter. I've had fights with some of my girls just because I wouldn't get myself a Rainbow Pride Starbucks cup. The cup itself became a huge battleground. Apparently, it matters what cup you hold. Well, pause right here so, because, I mean, this is pure. This is exactly how wokeism operates. They take something that's seemingly inconsequential uh, and they decide that life or death, the fate of the universe, your your status as a good person is riding on this. What kind of t-shirt you wear? Did you show up? You failed to show up at the trans demonstration and so on. And these poor parents, you, I, I kind of feel for them because they don't. They, want, they themselves don't inhabit this ideologically charged universe. Well, you know, I mean, in, in our case, I don't really like to talk about our personal, you know, kids. But, you know, I have two kids myself and, with, and Danielle. But, of course, Danielle is, she's rock solid, of course. We know she she's takes She's to the right of both you, of us. To the right of us. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then Justin, my son, who's uh, D's age, and, and um, he too is very hardcore, right? But it's the baby, the one that just graduated from Texas A&M of all places. I mean, you, Texas A&M once had the reputation of being perhaps the most conservative large state school in the country. And parents could feel pretty safe that they were going to that their, their kids would have conservative peers and that there would be at least a fair sprinkling of conservatives on the faculty. Not all of them, but at least some of them. But now it looks like Not even so. A&M has Not gone so. pivoted. A&M, A&M has gone woke. And it's a uh, it's horrifying, really. But um, anyway, she's but of course, you know, she's she's not she, she's not like these kids, you know, no. she loves us and she does actually defend she defends you on social media, uh, which is is, you know, well, I, I got, did think her line was kind of funny. Someone uh, writes her and <laughs> says, Dinesh is a cancer. <laughs> and she replied, actually, he's a Taurus, which I thought was a pretty good way to handle the situation. But uh, but I think what what's interesting in her case is that you can always tell if there's a leftist tide because if someone is not that political but just wants to be cool, yeah, they get yeah, yeah. carried by they the do. tide. And that's really what's happened. Yeah. She's ended up on the left side yeah. because that's where the water, that's where the waves are pushing her. Right, right. Let's come back to these deep programmers. Right. So this person named Cade Yang, 36, a former activist for trans and gay rights in upstate New York, at one point identif identified with they, them pronouns, but she said she deprogrammed herself before becoming a full-time de deprogrammer in 2018 and is now busier than ever. I love this. So you've got actually kind of a trans activist who says, hey, listen, I myself have been indoctrinated in trans ideology. I need to sort of excavate it out of myself. And then I'm going to set to work. And she now has a website, which, you, by the way, you can check out. It's called Stop Female Erasure. That's the website. Um, and also a website called The Deprogrammer, and she runs a YouTube account under the handle The Deprogrammer. So I actually need to check this she, she woman works, out yeah. because she apparently runs clinics, not only in schools, but even in prisons. And the basic idea here is to is to help people to think critically. She's not actually telling you to be this or to be that, but she's telling you don't fall victim to this bludgeoning ideology that is being driven into you yeah. uh, by intolerant teachers and intolerant uh, bureaucrats. And she even equates it to become to to being a member of a cult. I mean, she she calls it a cult. Well, I mean, so, look at look at some of these Antifa. Look at some of these young people on activists that you see, and we've seen them when I speak on campuses. There's a cult-like quality to them. 
Um, who else, when they hear something you don't agree with, runs screaming from out of the room? Of course, I, as a speaker, I'm delighted because I know I'm in the zone when people are running out of the room. Uh, but, but it is a clear measure of a certain type of Hare Krishna mentality, which is now a signature mark of contemporary wokeism. My dad wasn't a big believer in the stock market. He was kind of a put your money in the bank kind of guy. But I discovered in the early 1990s that investing in the stock market makes a whole lot of sense if you're in it for the long term. Problem is, we're in a very rocky economy with lots of craziness at home, lots of instability abroad. There's always the risk of a black swan event, a single event that comes out of nowhere and basically decimates your savings. So how do we take advantage of the upside of the market and protect ourselves against the downside? We need some really good guidance here. And my friend Rebecca Walser, she's a tax attorney and wealth strategist with her MBA from the London School of Economics. She and her team can help protect your wealth during these unprecedented times. Go to friendofdinesh.com, friendofdinesh.com, and book your complimentary introductory call today to see if you qualify. Again, that's friendofdinesh.com. Debbie and I uh, have watched uh, a series on, is it Netflix? No, actually, um, well, Netflix had this as a documentary uh, in 2018, and we did see that, uh, you know, the, that series uh, called The Staircase. And now HBO Max has a movie, you know, it's it's a fiction, well, it's not fictional, film. it's a feature film on that case. It's also called The Staircase, but it's on HBO Max. We just saw it's that. It's actually really fun to watch because it is one of those, uh, well, it's a, it's a true story. It's a kind of a murder mystery. And it has all these twists and turns that make your sympathies bounce back and forth. But the basic case involves a guy uh, living in Durham, North Carolina. He's a writer, uh, actually a Democrat. Uh, and kind of a whimsical fellow. He likes, he's cosmopolitan, he travels a lot, he likes uh, classical music, and he's got a blended family, and then his wife falls down the stairs, hence the title, The Staircase, dead. Uh, and he's accused of murder. He's accused of murdering her um, and throwing her down the stairs. Um, and initially, as I say, it seems preposterous that he did it, but then incriminating evidence comes out that shows that he has been living this double life, uh, not an affair, but uh, he's involved in all kinds of seedy uh, gay porn and all the stuff that goes, escorts and that whole world, supplying obviously a motive. Maybe the wife found out about it. So it takes off from there. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But we found it to be, I mean, you did too, I think. Yeah, well, I mean, the the so... Um, so the actual documentary that was in Netflix, remember when we watched it back in 2018, at the end of it, we were like, no, he didn't kill his wife. He may have been a weirdo. He may have been horrible, but he actually, we thought he actually loved his wife. So there's just no way there was really no motive for him to, to have done that. And it was just really strange the way the way the scene was because it was it was basically this this like uh, hallway staircase and there was a lot of blood and they found these really weird things on her skull and interestingly her skull was not fractured she didn't have a, a skull fracture uh, but she had these like marks on her on her head deep and scratches deep scratches that looked really strange yeah and and just a lot of blood and so it was very they oh and then so then the defense put out um this theory that it was actually a blow poke that that uh, was the murder weapon right and they couldn't find this blow poke and they were looking and they they had everybody convinced the jury everybody that it was a blow poke and that was how he killed her and then it comes to come to find out they find the blow poke and that was not the murder weapon i mean what i found so engaging about this whole thing is when i watched it at the beginning i thought this guy didn't do it. He seems he seems far too fragile, almost one of those kind of metrosexual type of guys. I'm like, he's not going to fling his wife, bludgeon his wife and throw her down the stairs. Then when all the gay stuff came out, I thought, well, this is a, this casts a new light on it. And mm -hmm. any jury is going to see this as motive. Then what made the whole thing even more powerful was it turned out that this same guy 
when he lived in Germany two decades ago, he was with a woman. I don't think they were married. No, no. And they guess were what? not married. But she ended up the same. She dead fell the down the way. stairs to her death. <laughs> yeah. So think about it. If you're a juror, guy's accused of throwing his wife down the stairs 20 years earlier, the exact same thing happened to another woman. You're much more likely to go, come mm -hmm. on. How? Mm -hmm. What is the probability mm -hmm. that the same freak accident could occur twice? So again, it pushes you strongly in the camp of his, mm -hmm. his he, even though it may seem unlikely he did it. And yet, as the case unfolds, you begin to realize, mm -hmm. well, to me, it, it is, um, it is, a, it shows how difficult it is sometimes to get at the full truth of the matter. Um, our jury system is probably as good as you can get. And yet, think about it, the jury convicted him. Yeah, they did. He served several and years. Interestingly, this woman that was also found dead at the foot of the stairs, uh, he raised her two daughters. And so they had a, you know, he and, and, and his wife that, you know, he was convicted of murdering in 2001, Kathleen, um, they raised those two girls. They raised his two sons and her daughter from her previous marriage. And so her daughter turned on him, believed that he did it. Uh, those two girls that he raised from the other woman always stood by him. And then his two sons, of course, stood by him until it turns out one of them now, the youngest son, thinks he did it. And he not only does he think he killed this wife, but he thinks he killed that woman as well. That so, to me is one of the more fascinating aspects yeah. of this story. It, it, it has so many, part of the twists and turns is the, is watching the family dynamics play out in terms of loyalty, disloyalty, defecting over to the prosecution side, agreeing to be a prosecution witness. And as you mentioned, in the case of the son, in both the documentary and the film, the son is completely with the dad. But then when you read up yeah, on it afterward, on end, yeah, no, it's crazy. in the aftermath, yeah, there yeah. was a change of heart. Yeah. Anyway, it's worth watching if, you, um, if you want to just watch a kind of, it's not really a political story, but it's, it's a pretty engaging whodunit and a sort of a thriller. I just know that every day after you finish the podcast, you go, more Dinesh, more Dinesh, more Dinesh. And I got a way for you to do that. Join my Locals channel, become an annual subscriber. And what you get with that is a lot of free movies. I've got several first-rate films up on the channel. Each one is handpicked by me and Debbie. These are powerful, moving films of the kind that Hollywood hardly ever makes anymore. Movies like 2000 Mules, Long Road Home, The Johnny Cash Family Story, A Terrific Adventure Story, Frontier Boys, The Stoning of Soraya M, starring Jim Caviezel, The Disruptor is a documentary for people with ADHD, and Sabina, a beautifully shot film set in Nazi-dominated Romania with an unforgettable Christian message. Many more films going up this year, 2023, my films as well as great films by others. And you can watch all of them just by becoming an annual subscriber to my local show. Channel. By the way, 50 bucks a year, it's less than $5 a month, plus you get all kinds of other exclusive content, including my weekly live Q&A. Sign up at Dinesh.locals.com. I'd love to have you along for this great ride. Again, it's Dinesh.locals.com. One of the uh, pieces of legislation that was taken up in the House and uh, passed by the Republicans is the so-called Born Alive Act. And uh, the implication of it is pretty simple. Uh, and that is that if an infant is born alive, you don't have the right to kill it. It just seems almost like the essence of uh, dignity and uh, humanity uh, and common decency. And yet... Yet the Democrats think it's yay okay to do. Um, and it is actually infanticide. When you when you think about it, you know, they, this is they, not even abortion they can, per se. They can argue all they want about, oh, you know, the, the, the it's my body, my choice because the baby's in my body, whatever. But at this point, the baby is not in your body. The baby is an actual infant born alive and they are OK with the baby dying. Let's look at the vote. So 210 Democrats vote against the bill require, requiring medical care for babies born alive after abortion attempt. Um, it, it just, you know, and, and I tweeted out, you know, if you have any doubt who the evil party is, just take a look at what they just did. 
I mean, this is, I think, has broader significance because when we think of the Democrats, there's always the question, are they well-meaning people who are just misguided? They support higher taxes because they don't realize that that's going to choke off the economy or they want um, appeasement with China because they don't realize that the Chinese Communist Party is really dangerous. So there's a tendency going all the way back to the Reagan years to understand the Democrats like this. But every now and then, and in fact, increasingly, I would argue now, we can see that, no, this is not a case of well-meaning people who are misguided. It is a case of very bad people doing very bad things. And this is the perfect. How else can you understand why the Democrats in virtual unanimity? Notice that this is not a case where it used to be, again, in the Reagan years, you had pro-life Democrats and the majority of Democrats are one way, but you've got a sort of strong contingent of Democrats who are the other way. No. Uh, the Democrats have become straight out a pro-abortion party. The only one that did not vote for this, for that voted for this bill, was Henry Cuellar of Texas. As we know, he's you mean the, he voted. He, he supported voted, the he Republicans. He supported the yeah. Republicans, and he, as we know, he was the only pro-life Democrat that we know of, besides. Uh, and the Democrats, by the, the way, Senator. they ran a progressive leftist against him yeah. uh, in the Rio Grande Valley, and and he he defeated the yeah. her, and then he turned on and defeated the Republicans. So he's yeah. um, and and Vicente Gonzalez, who defeated Myra Flores, uh, Vicente con la gente, that <laughs> for one. the people, yeah. So he voted present, which, as we know, present means no. I mean, right. that's what it means. But you know, it shouldn't surprise us because. Oh, back in 2003, when the then Senator Barack Obama was a senator in Chicago, in Illinois, um, uh, he, he too voted for an infant, you know, to, to be able to do this in, in their state house. Um, and Jill Stanick was a nurse that held a baby for 45 minutes until, until the baby died. Um, and she testified in front of him, and she said that she had never seen so much evil, you know, when she, until she looked into Barack Obama's eyes. Um, and so she has, um, she's I mean, talked about this. Here is a woman this. who was on the scene, and her conscience revolted. She like couldn't yeah. do it anymore. Yep. And so she uh, tried to share her feelings and the grim reality of the situation. And I guess what she said is Obama, frankly, could care less. He could care less. He was he he really could care less. And and so I guess what I'm getting at is that it is not surprising that these that these Democrats took this stance because for some really strange reason, and I'm not even sure what it is, I try to kind of put myself in their place to see really what drives them. But when it comes to infanticide, I just don't get it. I don't understand how. Well, you I saw Hakeem so Jeffries, the the kind of new uh, Pelosi replacement as the leader of the Dems, and he was saying something like, uh, "This is a first step to uh, the Republicans' broader agenda of attacking abortion rights." So he was putting his argument, perhaps in the most respectable form, in a sense, conceding that this is indefensible in itself. But he was arguing we have to vote no because this is only the the opening salvo of a... But look, I, I think right now the abortion debate is where it should be. The court has made a decision. They've decentralized this decision. And with the states, at least for now, let it remain. Modern science is based upon two faith-based propositions. And what I mean by faith-based propositions is that these are propositions that cannot be validated by reason or logic. And number one, that we live in a comprehensible universe that is lawful, that operates according to um, constant uh, and universal and even predictable laws. And second, that this universe is comprehensible to the human mind. In other words, that there's a match between the universe out there and what is going on in our minds in here. Now, Christianity did not invent the idea of a rational cosmos. In fact, uh, we owe this idea to the ancient Greeks, uh, not to the tradition of Socrates, but to the pre-Socratics. Now, if you've read the pre-Socratics, some of the stuff that they say appear as not only strange, but a little bit nonsensical. Uh, think of Thales, everything is made of water. Wow. 
uh, or Heraclitus, everything is always changing, or Parmenides, nothing is changing, everything is always the same. But if you uh, penetrate underneath what these guys are trying to say is they're trying to unify the cosmos. Everything is made of water is a way of saying the whole universe is made of the same kind of stuff. Uh, later, by the way, Democritus would speculate, and I say speculate, he didn't do any experiments, that this stuff was in fact particles or atoms. And so Democritus came kind of close, not um, entirely, but kind of close to the truth of the matter. And uh, but and then the pre-Socratics, when, when they say things like everything is changing or nothing is changing, there's a, again a unifying tendency here to try to, to explain everything that's going on in the form of one thing, uh, and then to argue that the perception that things are changing, for example, is an illusion. Uh, or the perception that everything is the same is an illusion because even things that are, quote, stationary are in fact viewed from a different perspective. They can be seen as being in motion. So what the pre-Socratics are doing in a big sense is they're, they're replacing the idea of the enchanted universe. The enchanted universe is a universe that's kind of mystical. It doesn't really follow any patterns or laws. Um, and let's remember that in ancient um, uh, religion, you had this idea that you have, well, a god of the river, a god of thunder. So you don't need laws. The god of the river decides how the river is going to flow. If he wants to move it in a different direction, well, he just basically does that. And the same is true with thunder. There's no kind of lawfulness to it. It's basically the god of thunder deciding to sort of sound off. And that's why we get we get thunder. So the pre-Socratics are replacing that enchanted world well, with the idea of a universe that is in some sense comprehensible. What Christianity does is it takes this idea and links it uh, to the idea of a rational God. In other words, God, who could have made the universe any which way he wanted, nevertheless chose to make a rational world, a world that operates lawfully um, and a world that is comprehensible to the human mind. Why? Why is it comprehensible to the human mind? Well, because the human mind contains a, uh, a flash uh, or a, a particle of God's rationality. We are made, after all, in God's image. The distinguishing feature of God is that God is a creator and a knower. And so we are not all powerful like God or all knowing like God, but we are knowing. We are, we do have some of God's ability to comprehend and even some of God's ability in a more, much more limited sense, of course, to create. Now, you might say, wait a minute, Dinesh, uh, I concede that human beings are created in God's image. I concede that human beings have intelligence. Uh, I even concede that Christianity is based upon the idea of a lawful universe. But what about miracles? Don't Christians, uh, along with some other religions, by the way, believe in miracles? And doesn't miracles violate the idea of a natural order or a lawful universe? And the short answer to that is no. Miracles don't violate the idea of a natural order. In fact, miracles, to be miracles, depend upon the idea of a predictable natural order. Let's think about it this way. Uh, if every time I threw something up, it didn't go down, it wouldn't be a miracle if I were to throw up a pen and it stays suspended in the air. The only reason that would be a miracle is because it contradicts the predictable practice that pens thrown into the air always fall to the ground. So a miracle is a sort of exception. It's kind of like saying we have a rule and everybody knows that the universe operates by rules, but on occasion, God can intervene in the universe and create an exception. So God's creating of exceptions, which by the way, takes divine action. God is sort of deciding, listen, I've created this order, but nevertheless, I'm going to kind of intrude upon it and produce a result. And by the way, sometimes miracles uh, are produced using the divine order itself. Debbie and I were talking about some research into the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, and one of the archaeologists believes that this occurred by an asteroid or a comet, some foreign object uh, from outer space hitting that part of the Earth and basically incinerating it like a nuclear explosion. So the point here being that, yes, that would be a miracle in the sense that God said, if Sodom and Gomorrah is sinful, 
I'm going to strike, I'm going to act directly in the world. But how does God do it? God does it using the natural processes themselves. So the point I'm trying to make here is that miracles by themselves do not contradict the idea of an orderly, rational cosmos comprehensible to the human mind. Subscribe to the Dinesh D'Souza podcast on Apple, Google, and Spotify, or watch on Rumble, YouTube, and SalemNow.com.